So, um, chapter 19, we got, we were in the, we already started this horrible, horrible story about the concubine from Gibeah. And we ended uh, with verse 25, where um, the, the, these people from, uh, from uh, Benjamin, from the city of Gibeah, get the concubine and that, that other daughter. And uh, well, they actually doesn't talk so much about the other daughter, but it's the concubine that's the main thing. Uh, he, he pushes her out, the, the, the husband, and they rape her and torture her all night. And then they send her on in the morning. Verse 26, toward morning, the woman came back. And as it was growing light, she collapsed at the entrance of the man's house where her husband was. When her husband arose in the morning, he opened the doors of the house and went out to continue his journey. Now pay attention to that. He, he's the one who sent her out the night before. And as far as he concerned, she's gone. He doesn't seem to care what happened to her. He's not looking for her. He opens the door in order to just continue his journey without her. And he stumbles over her. And there was the woman, his concubine, lying at the entrance of the house with her hands on the threshold. You can picture her with her last energy crawling, trying to make her way to the door. And her hands are outstretched there at, on the threshold and she collapses, okay? And he says to her, get up, he said to her, let us go. It doesn't even occur to him, does he care about her? He doesn't see her as a person. For him, she's just an object. Ah, ah, you're here? Okay, get up. But there was no reply. So the man placed her on the donkey and set out for home. She is just chattel. That's it. She's his property. He sent her away. Okay, I lost some property. It's the price I had to pay to stay overnight in this house. He's about to leave. There she is back. Ah, I got my property back. Ah, she's dead. Stick her on the donkey. Go home. It's absolutely outrageous. And I think that when, when we read the way the scripture, and I pointed out in, uh, along the way, various ways that things are expressed, words that are used, um, I think this is all on purpose. I think scripture is screaming out to us. This is terrible, terrible, okay? Now, he comes to his house. Uh, so the man, okay, when he came home, he picked up a knife, took hold of his concubine and cut her limb by limb into 12 parts. He sent them throughout the territory of Israel. And everyone who saw it cried out, Never has such a thing happened or been seen from the day the Israelites came out of the land of Egypt to this day. Put your mind to this, take counsel and decide. Basically, what he does is he cuts her up, sends it as like a message, one piece to every tribe with a message that's saying, OK, look at this. OK, look at how terrible this is. And he's telling everybody to come together to decide what to do. Now. The way it's presented until now, okay, first of all, there's no question. What was done to this woman is terrible. But my question is, did he really care? Did he really care about her? We've seen over and over about how he really doesn't care about her. What is he, maybe he's insulted, his pride is insulted, that his property was taken from him. I, I'm not sure, but he... He is now going to manipulate the situation, which is bad enough as it is, in order to get the entire nation of Israel angry, furious, about to do battle with the people of Gibeah. This is, this is what's going on here. So I think one of the things is that we continue on this story. We have to remember, there are no saints here. Nobody. I don't think there's anybody in this entire story that's good. They're all bad. Every one of them. OK, and you have to keep that in mind, because very often we're used to stories where we have a righteous person and an evil person and they clash in some way. And then we hope the righteous one wins. And then we say, yay. OK, here there are no winners. There are no righteous people. It is a mess. All right. And I think that is something it's a much more complex message than usual. But it's clearly something that is being. That is being um, discussed now. 
One of the things I saw in one of the commentators I thought that was very interesting, in verse 29, it says he held he held the concubine, uh, till called of a concubine, or held the concubine, and cut her up, okay? Now, the word in Hebrew is vayichazek, okay? It's holding, but it's holding very strong, okay? And the same exact word is used two other times in the context of this story. One is uh, at the beginning of the story in verse four. And this is, if you recall, this woman has run away from her husband and she's going back to her father's house. And after a time, the fellow decides, okay, I wanna get my concubine back. And he goes to her home in Bethlehem to bring her back. And it says there in verse four, that her her uh, his his father-in-law, the father of, of this concubine, holds on to him. I mean, in, in the English, it says something slightly different because it's it's talking about. Um, I'll find it in a second. It says uh, pressed him. Okay, but the actual word uses vayechazekbo. In other words, he held on to him. He he pressed him. He he is trying to pressure him to stay but the word that's used in hebrew is that he held on to him okay and here in a way and we discussed this about the whole story with the father-in-law but let's focus on this word holding on to him here the father-in-law seems to understand that there's a serious problem here he's concerned for the fate of his daughter and therefore he wants to hold on to him as long as possible because he feels like as long as they're with him he can protect his daughter and so you have this word by a chazak, you know, that he holds on to her, kind of foreshadowing he is holding on to her to protect her, unlike the two other instances when the husband holds on to her. In verse 25, he holds on to her in order, in order to throw her out to the gangs, to throw her out to the rapists. Okay, he, he t- he's very violent here. He takes her against her will and throws her out. Exactly the same word. And then again here, in verse 29, he's holding on to her. She's dead by now in order to cut her up. So we have the, the use of this word holding on when it's used in the context of the husband. It's violent and it's it's terrible uh, against this woman. And in contrast to the father who's trying to hold on to his daughter and protect her from this awful man. Um, okay, so that is... Um, so that how the, the chapter ends, chapter 19 ends, where he's re- he literally puts out a rally a rallying cry for war. You know, Utsu Vidaberu, let's let's take counsel and decide. Um the word Utsu, this take counsel, is often used uh in this in, in a context of let's like, take counsel in order to go to war. Okay. Um uh, it, it, actually, there's there's a, a I should have looked this up, but it, there's a very well known thing. Utsu eitz avitufar, okay, where we turn to to uh, God and we're saying when our enemies take counsel to fight us, you God will will undo their plans, okay? And it's it's that same idea. All right. Anyway, then we continue the story in chapter twenty, and we have really here a civil war. Now we are noted. In a few other instances where we were on the verge of civil war that was averted, uh, and we had a few times where there was a minimal, kind of minimal civil war uh, in the past through the through the book of Judges. But this is the first and only time that we have a major, major civil war involving everybody in Israel. And in this case, it is all the tribes of Israel against the tribe of Benjamin. So this is how it begins. As a result of his lovely message with the cut up body, Thereupon, all the Israelites from Dan to Beersheba and from the land of the Gilead, which of course is on the eastern side of the Jordan, marched forth and the community assembled to a man up before the Lord at Mitzpah. All the leaders of the people and all the tribes of Israel presented themselves in the assembly of God's people, 400,000 fighting men on foot. Um, so they're, they're gathering to go to war. They haven't, they're supposed to be talking about what to do next, but when you see 400,000 fighting men, they're not talking a whole lot, all right? They're gathering, they're already planning to go to war. Uh, And then we have this little parenthetical by the by, the Benjamites heard that the Israelites had come up to Mitzvah, okay? We, we, We just kind of flip over to the Benjamin side, but immediately in the very same 
verse, we already say the Israelites said, tell us how did this evil thing happen? Going back to the fact that they, the 400,000 men, have gathered it at uh, Mitzpah. So, so we have this little parenthetical thing in verse three, but we don't find out what happens next with the Benjamites until later on. So basically, the Israelites are talking to this Levite now as the star of the show. He's the one who's pulled everyone in, and they say, what happened? And listen to what he says. My concubine and I came to Gibeah of Benjamin to spend the night. The citizens of Gibeah set out to harm me. They gathered against me around the house in the night. They meant to kill me, and they ravaged my concubine until she died. He wasn't in danger. Yes, he was being protected. He was in the house, and the people uh, actually wanted him. They wanted the old man to, to give him up so that they could rape him, okay? But he, the way he presents is, it's all about me, you know? I'm the one poor thing. I was in danger. I was in harm. Nothing happened to him at the end. And he just says, as an afterthought, and they ravaged my concubine until she died. You get this impression that the two of them are standing in the center of the of the town, and they're both being persecuted. And in the end, what can happen? What can you do? They managed to kill her. They raped her and killed her. He managed to get away. So not what really happened. Okay, he gives her up to save his skin. Okay. But of course, he presents the story very differently. And then he explains that he cuts her up. He says, for an outrageous act of depravity had been committed in Israel. Now you are all Israelites. Produce a plan of action here and now. Okay. So the first thing they said, everybody saying as one, we will not go back to our homes and we will not enter our houses. Uh, we will wage war against Gibeah. And they say here, we will do it according to a lot. Okay. Now, we see two different things that they mention here a lot, lottery, something like that, some kind of a decision of how, how this is going to happen. Now, we know about decisions that are made by lottery. If we go to Joshua, for example, in um, Joshua chapter 16, chapter 17, uh, let's see where it begins. Yeah, chapter 14. Okay, when they are about to divide up the land and give each tribe its land, that's also done by a lot. Okay, it says uh, uh, these are the allotments. Let's let's we can look at, at chapter fourteen. These are the allotments of the Israelites in the land of Canaan that were apportioned by blah blah blah. The portions that fell to them by lot, as the Lord had commanded. Okay, and clearly when we're talking about a lot. In this context, we're talking about some kind of supernatural thing, okay? There's going to be some kind of an understanding of how to do this war directed by God. Now, we can also say that something similar goes on at the very beginning of Judges when they are, we have a similar situation in, in Joshua as well. But they're at the beginning of Judges and they're trying to say, um, who is... Um, Who's supposed to start first? The very beginning of Judges chapter one, verse one, after the death of Joshua, the Israelites inquired of the Lord, which of us shall be the first to go up against the Canaanites and attack them? The Lord replied, let the tribe of Judah go up. Okay, now keep these two things in mind because both of these kind of situations are reflected here. The idea of a lottery that is that is de decided by God, okay? And at the same time, a question asked of God having to do with battle, should we go up? Who should go first, etc.? And that's coming to play here. So when they're talking about deciding what to do based upon a lottery, it is going to have something to do with inquiring of God. Now, um, what our, our traditions tell us, and this is, of course, based on scripture, um, we know, for example, that the high priest has a very special breastplate, okay? And that breastplate has stones different different stones that each represent a different tribe and sometimes also represent different letters and so the tradition is that when they went to the high priest to the temple or to the tabernacle and they inquired uh of of god through the high priest that there would be different stones that would be illuminated that would be the way that god spoke the answer okay so for example in in the um beginning of Judges, when he's asking 
the asking of God who should go first, and the, the answer comes back, Judah, the understanding is that the stone for Judah would have lit up, and that would have been God's answer, okay? So this is a tradition that we have, that this is how the mechanism worked. Maybe it worked differently, but this is more or less how it is. But it also explains the fact why the high priest is the intermediary. Why do you need to go to the high priest to get the answers? Because it's coming through his that, that breastplate that he wears. Um, so keep that in mind here, too, because that is also going to play a, a role. OK, so what does he do? So they said they're going to figure this out based upon Lot. But meanwhile, before they do any lotteries or any asking of God, they're already organizing. We will take from all the tribes of Israel 10 men to the 100, 100 to the 1,000, 1,000 to the 10,000 to supply provisions for the troops to prepare to the going to Gibeah. Okay. And again, we have for all the outrage that is committed in Israel. We're talking about this terrible outrage, which 100% what they did to this woman is outrageous. Okay. But what these people in Israel may not know or may not have asked, or I don't know what, is that this fellow that they're going to defend, this Levite, isn't exactly a saint himself. All right. Anyway, so they go against the town. But meanwhile, they send a message to Benjamin. And this is in verse 12. What is this evil thing that has happened among you? Come hand over those scoundrels in Gibeah so that we may put them to death and stamp out the evil from Israel. So. This actually is a very positive sort of thing because what they're actually trying to do, they're seeking justice. They don't want to kill everybody. They don't want to go to war with anybody. But what they're saying to Benjamin, you have to take responsibility. There were people in Gibeah who did this. You need to find out who they are and turn them over for judgment. Um, get rid of them. And then we're finished. Okay. And, but however, the Benjamites would not yield to the demand of their fellow Israelites. So now you have is both, again, you have Israelites amassing for war um, before they even put forth this demand to Benjamin, they've already amassed for war. Now it's possible that the only way they assume Benjamin would take their inquiry seriously if they already see them as an army amassed for war on their borders. But it, it, it still begs the question, how, were they sincere about trying to resolve this in a judicial way or did they wanna go to war anyway? But clearly, Benjamin is standing behind these evil people. So the tribe of Benjamin, it, it, here you do see that they, they are covering for this terrible sin. They're, they become accomplices in a, in a sense. And so there's, a, there's clearly a certain justice uh, at this point in, in fighting against all of Benjamin because they are all standing behind this terrible thing that was done. Okay. So now we see that we have a, a war. Okay. So the Benjamins gathered from their towns in Gibeah in order to take the field against the Israelites. On that day, the Benjamins mustered from the town 26,000 fighting men, mustered apart from the habitants of Gibeah 700 picked men of all this force, 700 men who were left-handed. Uh, every one of them could sling a stone at a hair and not miss. So we have here uh, actually two different groups of three different, we have a total of 26,000 people. We have 700 people that are coming from Gibeah, and in addition, there are 700 people who are very, uh, very specially trained warriors. OK, they're I guess you would call them sharpshooters in a way they, they can use that slingshot and really, you know, they're snipers with the slingshot. OK, but this is interesting. They are all these 700 are all left handed. OK, now we met left handed before, if you'll recall. Ehud, who was one of the first judges, Ehud, son of Gera, he is also left-handed and he is a Benjamite. So clearly there is something uh, genetic in that Benjamite family to have these left-handed people. I, I don't know how significant it, but I thought that was interesting. Anyway, meanwhile, on the other side, so we have the Benjamites, but there's 26,000. Meanwhile, the men of Israel, other than Benjamin, mustered 400,000 fighting men, okay? And they go at this point, so we have army next to army, and then all of a sudden, they're going to go and ask God. They proceeded to Beth El and inquired of God. Now, the in Hebrew, Beth El means house of God. And there are some people that say this is the place called Beth El, which is where Jacob was, you know. There are some people who say this was Shiloh. Because at the time, the tabernacle was in Shiloh. 
Phineas would have been in Shiloh. The high priest would have been in Shiloh. What were they going to do in Bethel? And so what they're saying is that they're not looking at the word Bethel as Bethel as a place, but as the house of God. Where was the house of God? It was in Shiloh. So, you know, you can take whatever one you like. There are interpretations in either way. But meanwhile, they go to ask of God. And here we don't have any mention of Phineas, but we just say they're asking of God, who of us shall advance first to fight the Benjamites? And the Lord replied, Judah first. Now, this is exactly the same kind of question we just saw at the beginning of Judges. And it kind of fits into this pattern. When Israel is going out to battle, Judah is the leader. They are the first they are the first uh, tribe. They're the leader of, of the bench, of the army. Okay, now, um, what they did not ask, though, is should we go out to battle? And they also did not ask, will we succeed in battle? Okay, all they asked is, who shall go first? And so what this indicates is, a, is definitely a degree of arrogance. They're bothering to ask God, why aren't they asking God, are we doing the right thing? Should we be fighting against these people? They just assume it and they go. But but God replies to them, telling Judah first. And so the question, of course, becomes, and it's a question I'm leaving out there for a bit, because we're going to have to come back to it. Does this mean that God approves of this battle? God doesn't tell them not to. He doesn't tell them yes. But he says Judah should go first. So there is, in a way, um, uh, an approval of some level of this battle. Maybe not an approval, maybe just, you know, manipulating the situation to what God thinks should happen. I'm leaving this question up in the air. It's a question we have to revisit because the question gets more serious as we move on. Okay. So they go on that first day. The Benjamins come out for Gibeah and they struck down 22,000 men of Israel. Okay. So here, what happens after that? Verse 22. The army rallies and again drew up in battle or the same place as that on the first day. And then they go and they weep before the Lord. And here they ask, shall we again join battle with our kinsmen, the Benjamites? So now for the first time, they're asking, should we continue in battle? Now, what's going on here? They go to God and they say, who should go first? Judah. They don't say, should we battle? So it could be after they lose 20. I mean, in this first day, 22,000 men of Israel are killed. And we don't know, learn of any losses of the Benjamites. The, the Israelites are routed, okay? And so they may sit back and say, oh my, maybe we should have asked God to begin with. Should we go? We never asked him. We just said, who should go? Maybe not. So now they cry and they weep and, they, and there's a certain level perhaps of repentance. I'm not sure. And then they said, well, should we go? And here God says, go against them, march against them. So he clearly tells them to do battle, but does he tell them they will win? No. And they don't ask. There's also perhaps a little arrogance here, an assumption like, well, if God tells us to go, of course he's going to give us the, the win. He's going to help us win or whatever. He'll hand us the, the, the victory. But that's not what happens. The Israelites advance against the Benjamins on the second day. But the Benjamins came out from Gibeah against them on the second day and struck down 18,000 more of the Israelites, all of them fighting men. So at the end of two days, the Israelites lose 40,000 men. Okay, that's a ton. So now they're really, the Israelites are just besides themselves. They think they're fighting the just cause. They're fighting to rout out this evil of the Benjamites that not only people within their midst raped and murdered this woman, but they, this whole tribe uh, gave them uh, backing. Then all the Israelites, all the army went up and came to Bethel and they sat there weeping before the Lord. They fasted that day until evening and presented burnt offerings and offerings of well-being to the Lord. The Israelites inquired of the Lord for the Ark of God's covenant were there in those days. And Phinehas, son of Eleazar, son of Aaron, the priest ministered before him in those days. And of course, this is the basis for which people will say, this is the house of God, not Bethel. This is actually in Shiloh, okay? Because otherwise, where we don't know. Well, is it possible that at some point the Ark of the Covenant moved and the Tabernacle moved to Bethel and then back to Shiloh? I don't know. We don't know about it. So, but this is the basis for it, okay? And we learn here that Phineas is there. He's the high priest. And this, by the way, is when we talked about when does this take place. 
that uh, this is why the, the fact that Phineas is there is um, a basis for believing that this story actually takes place at the beginning of the book of Judges, because the end of the book of Judges is 370 years or so after the entrance uh, of the people into the land of Israel, even more 300. The book, book of Judges itself is 369 years, another 20 years or so for the book of Joshua. So it's it's close to 400 years uh, after they come into the land of, of Israel and Phineas came in already as an adult into the land of Israel. He certainly didn't live 400 years. So this is why it is assumed that this actual story took place at the beginning. Okay, and now here he says, and they ask God, shall we again take the field against our kinsmen, the Benjamins, or shall we not? Okay. And um, it, here, of course, they leave it. They, they, you get a sense of a little bit more humility. It's not just should we, but maybe we shouldn't. Okay. They, they're, they're questioning what's going on. And here we have a very clear answer from God. The Lord answered, go up for tomorrow. I will deliver them into your hands. Okay. And then we see how uh, uh, many times um, there is a word in, in Hebrew that is orev. Orev means ambush. And you see in verse 29, Israel put men in ambush against Gibeah on all sides. Um, but you have this word coming out over and over again. I'm trying to see if it's actually, uh, no, they don't. Yes, it is. It is in, in, in English as well. You'll see a number of times you talk about ambush. Um, 20, verse 29, Israel put men in ambush against Gibeah. And then we have um, uh, in verse 33, the Israelite ambush was rushing out from its position at Maragheba. Uh, and then we go on um, uh, in verse uh, 36. Uh, they relied on the ambush, which they led against Gibeah. 37, one ambush quickly deployed against Gibeah, and the other ambush advanced and put the whole town to the sword. 38, a time had been agreed upon by the Israelite men with those in ambush. And on and on, this word ambush keeps coming back. And so one of the things we're seeing about this third day of battle is that their tactics have completely changed. And I am going to borrow a, an idea that I once heard in reference to the battle for the AI. And those of you who studied Joshua with me, I mentioned it there. Um, the, the battle for the AI fails miserably the first time, and the second time it succeeds. And study with very, very often, his name is Rabbi Samet, Rabbi Elchanan Samet. And he analyzed the situation there saying, that the first time they went with arrogance and how that is that is displayed in a number of different ways. One of the ways is in comparing the first time with the second time. The first time there's no plan. The, in the, the battle of AI is right after the battle of Jericho. The battle of Jericho is a completely supernatural battle. They blow some trumpets, they march around, the walls come tumbling down and they go in. Uh, and there's a certain arrogance there that expects that AI is going to be easy, even though God never says to them, there's going to be a supernatural thing. They're just supposed to go to war, but they're so arrogant and they're so confident that God will just be there to, to lift them up and everything will be good that they don't do the basics of planning a battle strategy. And one of the things you see in the second battle for the AI is this idea of an ambush. They take some people and they put them there and another group there and they, you know, they trick the enemy and they have them going in one direction and then they ambush from the other direction. You see the same thing here, whereas on the first two days they go and they say, should we go? Are we going? Who should go first? You get the sense of arrogance that they are so convinced, these Israelites, in the justice of their cause, they are so convinced that God is just going to hand them victory. They just just go and, and fight. And by the third time, you also see let a certain level of repentance, they're, they're fasting, they're praying, they're bringing offerings, but at the same time, their whole fighting strategy is completely different. They are relying heavily on, on ambushes and, and tricks and, 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 and dividing up the fighting force, taking the battle very seriously and realizing, of course, they have to work hard if they are going to uh, succeed, and they do. And here we have in verse 35, very interesting. We don't have that they win, okay? At the end, we learn about, you know, they did this. What does it say in verse 35? The Lord routed the Benjamites before Israel. 
We then find out that day the Israelites threw, slew 25,100 men of Benjamin, all of them fighting men. Uh, but the, the, the introductory sentence here is that the Lord routed them. And I think that's also part of the, the transition that the nation of Israel begins to go through. They go from arrogance, they're totally con convinced of the righteousness of the cause. They haven't even questioned this Levi, exactly what happened and what was your role. And it's this Levi comes and he issues his battle cry and I'm the wounded party and you have to come with me. Does that take away from the fact that the Benjaminites were terrible? They were terrible. And that's probably why at the end of the day, God did assist them in their battle. And he, at the end, it was the Lord who routed the Benjamites because they deserve the punishment. But the Israelites came here not with clean hands. They had problems. They lost themselves 40,000 men uh, between the first two days. And, and as we see, we see the problems, we see what was going on. And it seems to me that what God is doing here is manipulating um, both sides so that they're essentially each getting their just desserts, okay? Benjamin gets its just dessert, okay? But there's definitely sin in the Israelite camp as well. And they're not gonna come out roses here because they also, uh, there's serious problems in, in what has happened uh, to them. So we are going to stop here um, um, and we're gonna take up with the end of chapter 20, uh, next, not, uh, not next week, we're gonna be missing next week. We're taking up in two weeks with the end of chapter 20 with the outcome of the war, what happens to the Benjamites? Okay, what happens to the Benjamites? And of course that takes us into 21. So I do anticipate completing the book of Judges in two weeks, okay? in that class that I will be giving uh, from Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, and until then, uh, we'll see each other again in two weeks, I guess. But anyone have questions, turn on your mics. Happy to happy to entertain them now. Um, Sandra, I wanted to ask you, do you have any idea where that concept of the stone lighting up uh, in order to make decisions, the breastplate stone? I don't, it's just something I've always known and heard. It's just so rooted in Jewish tradition that I really don't know the origin, but I can look it up. Do me a favor, okay. send me an email and I will look it up and, and give you some sources on that. Okay, thank you. Sandra, Any other questions? Yes, I do have. Uh, maybe I don't have the correct pronunciation, but the last words in chapter 19, uh, Right. How do you translate that? Is it a way for the writer to uh, speak and, and ask the question to the audience or the reader, or what is it about? It's a declaration. In other words, basically, this man has sent the, the body pieces out and he is expecting the following. He says, everybody who's gonna see it is gonna say, oh my goodness, we haven't seen anything like this. And therefore he is saying to them, look at this, pay attention to this. And Utsu Vidaberu, take counsel and decide. This, in what his words are saying is, okay, let's think about what we're gonna do about this. But the way he's saying it and the use of words is really a call to battle. Look at how terrible this is. Gather together because we have to do something about this. But when he's saying we have to do something about this, he's clearly talking about we need to we need to go to battle. Okay. Uh, is it? I mean, it, you, the word "kill" or something like that isn't used. But is it no. out of every kind of that that he actually killed his concubine when he cut her in twelve pieces? No, she was dead. Oh, no, 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 or she was he, dead. He, is she dead already or did he kill no, her? No, 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 she was definitely dead because it says here, um, uh, and verse 28, um, get up, he said to her, let us go. But there was no reply. So the man okay. placed her on the donkey and set out for home. Okay. So um, it's very clear that mm. she's dead. Mm. And I mean, actually, the... the uh, what were you doing? It's Vadaberu. Simulachem. That would be like Simulev, wouldn't it? Right, Pay right, attention. absolutely. Yeah. Put your mind to this, is the way it's translated in my English. Simulachem Aleha. Okay? Mm. 
put, you know, pay attention to this. Yeah, hundred hmm. percent. And but he doesn't say let's go to battle. He says let's all take counsel and figure out what to do. But hmm. in but in sending out the body parts with this terrible message of there's never been anything like this since you know Israel came out of Egypt. He it, it's a very um, um, what would you say? It's a, it's it's a very antagonizing, you know, uh, type of message. You know, he he's clearly trying to rile them up for battle. He's decided already. Oh yeah, he did, and he gets them to decide. I mean, I mean, really, he could have written a letter that said, "You know, I had a real problem with Benjamin. Let's all get together and decide what to do. I think we have a problem in one of our tribes." That's a whole different ball game. He sends out body parts and he says, we got to come together. They already gathered. You know, he knows how to turn them on. They gather already for war. That's what happens at the next thing. Mm -hmm. All the leaders of the people, the tribes of Israel present themselves in the family of God's people, 400,000 fighting men. I mean, you know, they got the message all right. Yeah. Anyway, it's a terrible story. No, no question. Absolutely no question. Um, anyway, I really okay. appreciate you. Sandra. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us today. And uh, I will see you again in two weeks. I will send a reminder next week that we will not be having class. And we'll send a reminder the following week that the class will be happening. Okay. And okay. Uh, Carol, you. wherever you are, if you're still there, I hope to see you in North Carolina. And Liz, send me an email. Okay. Great. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Nice I hope you enjoyed that film. And we have lots more film content and emails and articles that I'm sure you will enjoy as well. Check out our website at cfoic.com and subscribe to our newsletter. You can do that right from the homepage. I know you will really enjoy the content that will land in your inbox on a regular basis. Hope to see you soon.